Hang on a second. Don't start me yet, Gary. <laughs> All right, he started me. <laughs> Greetings, friends. Welcome to our Tuesday night Bible study at Granite Bay. We're uh, going through the book of Genesis. I'm adjusting my microphone here. We're continuing our study in the book of Genesis. And um, tonight's study, we're going to be dealing with Genesis chapter 6. And we may spend a little bit of time on this particular passage because um, it, we get a lot of questions on this. This is, this is a very controversial verse. Uh, we're going to take a lot of time dealing with Genesis chapter 6, maybe 1 through 8. And um, I think it's important because... Um, so many people get confused about it. Even just this week, I was driving along and I heard a pastor on the radio um, talking about this subject and perpetuating the often uh, repeated myth about what it's talking about. Um, we have a free offer tonight that goes along with the subject, dealing with, you know, who are the sons of God? And it's a booklet and it's called Aliens or Adopted, Who Are the Sons of God? It's a free book. You can download it for free to read it. If you go to, um, so you can text us, for one thing, just text the word ALIENS. That's right, A-L-I-E-N-S 40544. And um, you'll find the information there where you can uh, download this book and uh, for free and read it. Um, Let's go ahead, we'll, we'll delve right in. Something happened here, and I'm trying to fix it. There we go, I think I got it fixed. If you go to Genesis chapter 6, and you read in verse 1, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now, I don't know if any of you were around when this happened, but back in 1938, there was a uh, terrifying radio broadcast. Um, I think it was NBC was going through their regular evening program, lineup show, music. All of a sudden, someone broke in with a news report that these space vehicles had landed somewhere in New Jersey, I think it was, or... And uh, then they'd cut back to the music. Then the news reporter would break in again. And he'd say that there's some creatures coming out. Then they cut back to the music. And then it turned into a, just a full-blown live news report about an alien attack. Well, it turned out that uh, young Orson Welles was, um, he had taken the H.G. Wells uh, story about the War of the Worlds and he had turned it into a radio script, but they never explained or people miss the part where it said, you know, this is going to be a dramatic recreation. And people all over the country, that's back when radio was, you know, one or two, three stations were all across the country through repeaters. And all across the country, people who turned into the broadcast thought it was, it was so realistic. They had sound effects in the background, and Wells would come on, Orson Wells would come on as a, uh, a radio announcer, and he'd be giving blow-by-blow -blow descriptions of how these creatures are using these death rays and burning everybody up, and supposedly some people committed suicide. They thought it was the end of the world and folks were running, jumping in their cars and packing food and heading for the hills and... and He had to, I think, answer to Congress or some inquiry about the, the whole program and issued an apology because so many people were terrified and thought the world was ending. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of preachers who think that the earth was invaded by aliens a long time ago. They read Genesis chapter 6, and they think the sons of God who knew the daughters of man were creatures from outer space or fallen angels. And the way they read this, now let me go through it here, and just I'm going to read through it, and then I'll back up, and we're going to take it apart verse by verse. As a matter of fact, some of you may even have some Bible translations that render it that way, if you've got a paraphrase. Came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born to them. And the sons of God, they believe those were unfallen, or rather fallen angels or aliens, saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, 
and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days will be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. There you have it again. They bore children. So it's not just these angels or aliens taking human wives. Seems like they're able to procreate. It's the way that some people teach it. They bore children to them. And those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, the Nephilim. And when the Lord saw the wickedness, when the Lord saw that, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy the man whom I created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I don't know how far we're going to get into Noah, but we'll just play it by ear and see. First of all, who are the sons of God? Now, there is a book. Have you heard of the book of Enoch? There's a book called the book of Enoch. Matter of fact, Jude quotes something from the book of Enoch. Now, the book of Enoch is what you would call an apocryphal book. It's not part of the Bible. Some people think it should be included as part of the Bible because Jude quotes it. Paul also quotes Roman or Greek poets. That doesn't mean everything a Greek poet said is true. There are truths. I mean, preachers quote Pilgrim's Progress, but Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory. It's not a true story. It's not scripture. And so because Jude quoted something that may have been true from this book of Enoch, now think about it. How would a book of Enoch have gotten down to people today. When did Enoch live? Before or after the flood? So this would have been a book that was written before the flood. Now before the flood they weren't doing a lot of writing because people had such prodigious memories that they didn't need books. It's not until later you find that men their minds are starting to go and their lives are shorter and they don't have the photographic memories and they start writing things down. But um, I don't know that there's a record of books before Noah so the idea that Enoch wrote a book and somehow Noah kept it and then Noah passed it on to Abraham who somehow got it on to Jacob and you know the, just the, the idea of that. Now what may have happened, the sayings of Enoch, how many of you remember that best-selling book came out years ago called Roots where Alex Haley dug and dug and dug and he, he went back and found his ancestors and they had these um, storytellers in Africa that would retrace from memory. They would go back generations and tell all these details of the bit different people in the tribe and they sort of were like the guardians of the memories of the tribe. And he was able to trace back the history of his family to slaves all the way to Africa when that slave was captured. Yeah, kin, kin, Kunta Kinde, yeah, I remember that. And um, uh, it could be that things that Enoch said were passed on orally through Noah and Seth to Abraham and on down. Moses, of course, got some of the conversations. But the whole book of Enoch, by the time, you know, you get to the time of Christ, there was a lot of apocryphal things that were added during the Babylonian captivity. But here's what you read in the book of Enoch after that long introduction. It happened after the sons of man had multiplied in those days that the daughter were bo daughters were born to them, elegant and beautiful. And when the angels, the sons of heaven, beheld them, they became enamored of them, saying to each other, Come, let us select for ourselves wives of the prodigy of men, and let us beget children. Now that is a totally fanciful story. But some pastors have taken this passage from the book of Enoch, which is not scripture, and they've tried to make it sound like Jesus didn't mean what he said when he told us that angels do not marry nor are they given in marriage. Angels do not procreate. Angels are created. They are not born. There's nothing in the Bible that leaves us to believe that they're born. Neither are they aliens. God does not allow, God, I believe God does have creatures on other planets, but aside from the angels, he doesn't allow them to interact with our world because our world is fallen. There's sin down here. It's contagious. And so uh, this notion, I think, is, is far out. Now let's find out what does the Bible say. Jesus says, Mark 12, Are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the Scriptures? This is verse 
24 of Mark 12. You do not know the scriptures of the power of God, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of heaven. And then you can read in Luke chapter 20, verse 36, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Okay, so here it's telling us that humans can be called sons of God, but they have lives that are lives measured with the angels. Now, how do we know angels live a long time? Who is it that appears to Daniel in uh, chapter 9? He's got a name. Gabriel. Now, 500 years later, who else does Gabriel appear to? Mary, right? And I don't think he's aged a bit. So angels are eternal. They have lives that measure with the life of God. Um, the Bible says in Psalm 104, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. Hebrews 1.14 says, are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister? They're, they're what? They're spirits. Are people spirits? So the idea that these fallen spirits got married to humans is you start thinking about it, it's pretty far-fetched. But a lot of, you can ask Pastor Ross, I think we had that question last week. We get that question probably 20 times a year. People start reading, especially in January. They say, I'm going to read through the Bible. And before they get very far, we get the question, who did Cain marry? Then they read a little further. We say, what's this business about the sons of God marrying the daughters of men and having giants? <laughs> and they, they're always interested in that. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, so angels are not what? They're not flesh and blood. So I don't want to go too far into this, but you just think about the practical problems that would arise from spirits uh, procreating with humans. Um, now, it doesn't surprise me, in the world there's this whole, uh, some of you who are older remember the Rosemary's baby idea, that the Antichrist was going to be the result of the devil um, getting married to a human, and that there would be this Antichrist offspring. And there's churches that teach and believe something like that. But the Bible tells us nothing about angels or aliens procreating with humans. Well, let's find out what it does mean. Let's use the Bible to give the proof for it. Um, you can read now, we, we want to know who are the sons of God. Job, the sons of God is a word that can be used a couple of different ways. And I want to be honest and give both sides of the story. You do read in Job 1, now there was a day in verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. The Bible says, when the morning stars sang, to get, sang together, this is Job 38, 7, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Who are these sons of God in the book of Job? Well, as near as we can tell, they are the leaders of unfallen worlds. Because if you look in the genealogy of Luke, what is, what is Adam called? Let me read it to you here. Luke chapter 30, Luke 3.37 which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Mahaliel, which was the son of Cainan, which was the son of Enos, we're going backwards now, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Now all the other sons were called sons of their fathers. But when you get to Adam, he's called the son of God. Why? He's created and he's the leader of a world. So we believe these sons of God in the book of Job we're leaders of other worlds and God is holding communion with them somehow and Satan comes to represent this earth. He's not on the earth because the Lord says, where do you come from? Now God knew. It's like he said to Adam, where are you? God knew. So he says to Lucifer, where do you come from? He says, I've come from the earth. He's not on the earth. How can you be on the earth if you've come from the earth? He says, I came from the earth from walking up and down and to and fro in it. And so here, the sons of God represent uh, leaders of unfallen worlds. But when you become born again and you are recreated in God's image, you and I become sons of God. Look, for example, Matthew 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called 
sons of God. It actually means children, but translates both ways. John 1.12, But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. All right, we're getting a clue now. Who are these sons of God? They're people who are converted. They're born again. They worship God. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Look at Philippians 2, 15. That you might be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. And who's he talking to? Aliens, angels, or people? These are humans. Galatians 3, 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So when someone's born again, they're recreated. They are the sons of God. Now, and this is a, one of the last ones I'll give you here. Uh, Galatians 4, 5. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might redeem, re receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, an heir of God through Christ. Um, look in Isaiah 43, verse 6. I know you, you might be jotting these down. You can't look them up this quick. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Who is the sons and, God, and daughters of God? Everyone who is called by my name whom I have created. All right, so it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men. So if the believers are the sons of God, who are these daughters of men? It's obviously two different groups. Well, remember what happened? After Cain killed his brother, he left. It says Cain took his wife, one of his sisters, and he left. And he went and he built a city. And they remained two distinct people. And you look in Genesis 4, it says, Adam, now we read this before, but I want to go back to it briefly. Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, she said, has appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth also there was born a son. He called his name Enos. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. The children of Seth, they taught them about God. The descendants of Seth called upon God. Who's going to be saved? In the last days it says, all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Calling upon the name of the Lord means, doesn't mean you pray once, it means people who have a habit of turning to God, they have communion with God, that the Lord is their God, they will be saved. So it's saying, here's this whole tribe, this whole uh, group that are calling upon God. They do not interact with Cain Cain is in rebellion. He's turned from God. He's doing his own thing. As long as they stayed separate, the chosen seed, the descendants of Seth, they remained pure. But notice what else is happening here in Genesis. Uh, the separation doesn't stay complete. Matter of fact, read in Genesis 4, 16, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. So you got these two sons. Seth, descendants, call on the name of the Lord. Cain, Where's he go? Out from the presence of the Lord. And he dwelt in the land of Nod. He knew his wife and she conceived and bare a son. Enoch and he built a city. And he called the name of the city after the Lord. No, he called it after the name of his son. And so now there are, it's just like two different, one's making a name for himself, one's calling upon God. Two different clans are growing up in the world. The sons of God and the children of men. The word there, men, is coming from the word enos. It means mortal dying man. It's not talking about um, just regular humans. This is talking about the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Seth. So as long as they remained separate, the people calling upon God, there was hope. Yeah, question? Does that include Cain's children, descendants? Cain's children, it seems like, matter of fact, you read about Lamech. Lamech said, uh, I've killed a man and if vengeance is going to go on Cain, whoever hurts Lamech, it won't be seven times, it'll be 70 times seven. So you can see right away there's murder happening in Cain's family with his tribe. And so they kind of had turned from God. But um, Seth and Adam and Eve, they were still sacrificing somewhere near the gates of the Garden of Eden. 
and they were trying to main, uh, be loyal to God while maintaining some separation. Yeah, if the children of Seth had turned from being rebellious and called upon God, yeah, Cain, that's what I mean, Cain. Uh, sure, you know, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. And there could have been some who went, you know, you can assume that if the children of Seth began to intermarry with the daughters of Cain, it was probably happening the other way too. But as long as they maintained some kind of separation, this one group had some holiness. Now, have you read before where it says... Um, 2 Corinthians 6.14 Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? And that's another word for the devil. Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate. Now, that's a very important verse. When it says come out among them and be separate, does that mean we should all run for the hills and live like hermits? Or is it just saying, uh, should Christians intermingle with unbelievers for the purpose of witnessing? Yes, Paul's not talking about that. Paul did a lot of witnessing among the Gentiles. So he's clearly not saying, you're, you're holy, they're defiled, don't get near them. But he's talking about don't live among them and don't learn their ways. He says, come out among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you, and you'll be my sons and my daughters. There you have it again. What was the big concern God had when the children of Israel came into the promised land? Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 1. When the Lord your God will bring you into the land that you go to possess and you cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, that when God shall deliver them before you, you shall smite them and utterly destroy them. You'll make no covenant with them, no show mercy unto them, neither shall you make marriages with them. Your daughter shall not you give unto his son, you shall not give your daughters to them, nor his son to his daughter. You shall, um, nor give your son unto his daughter. For they will turn away thy son from following me. And so God said, do not intermarry with the unbelievers. What fellowship has light with darkness and Belial with Christ? And, and um, so God was very clear. This started to happen. What happened? The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives. Now let me see if I can find this real quick. I'm going to look in, uh, is it, um, I think it's 1 Kings 11. 1 Kings 11. But, and you know what's really interesting? If you look in 1 Kings chapter 10, um, let me see. <coughs> yeah, there was uh, actually a verse, and I, I can't remember what verse it is. In 1 Kings chapter 10, it says it's 666 talents of gold came to Solomon. Verse 14, is it? Yeah. She, Karen's got it. If you look in 1 Kings 10, 14, I got a new Bible here and it's not all marked up. The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents. Now, does that number jump out at you? <laughs> you know what I think is interesting here? Is up to that number, when you're reading the story of Solomon, it gets better and better. Solomon loves the Lord, he builds the temple, things are going well, the nation's turning to God, they're prosperous, other nations are coming to learn about God, that was his plan all the time. Closest Israel ever gets to God's ideal for them is when you get to like chapter 9, the Queen of Sheba comes to learn about true God and Solomon exalts God and she goes away, says her breath was taken away, there was no more breath left in her. You've heard of a breathtaking experience? That's what she has, it was breathtaking. 
That's the very word. It says there, there is no more spirit in here, and that word is breath. And so you just see everything is getting glorious. The son of David's on the throne. Even Jesus said, you know, Solomon was the only thing Jesus could compare to the flowers. Do. There's no, nothing greater than Solomon except maybe the flowers God made. So, but then it says, after the number 666, you go to chapter 11, notice what it says. But King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites, Zidonians and Hittites. Didn't we just read about that? From the nations whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. So when the sons of God began to intermarry with the daughters of men, in Genesis chapter 6, you begin to see what's happening. And it's right after that God says, my spirit will not always strive with men. Do you remember reading that part? What is that talking about? If you look in 1 Peter, this is a really important verse to highlight where it says this here in uh, Genesis. Let me go back to it real quick. Um, verse 3, God says, my spirit will not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. His days will be 120 years. How long did Noah preach? This is where we get the 120. Because Noah appears at the end of this passage here, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God calls Noah right after he makes this statement about them losing their holiness through intermarriage. Then you read in 1 Peter chapter 3, For Christ has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now this is the part that really confuses people. By which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffer suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Is this saying that when Jesus died on the cross, he went down into the grave and he preached to those who back in the days of Noah were destroyed? That's the way some preachers preach it. Any of you heard that before? See, I, I went to a lot of these other churches before I was an Adventist, and even after I became an Adventist, I kept visiting my friends on Sunday, and, and I can just tell you that a lot of people believe that Jesus didn't die on the cross. They believe that he went down into hell to preach to people who needed a second chance. Now, it'd be nice to believe that, but what does the Bible say? It's appointed unto man once to die, after that the judgment. There's no second chance after death. So what does Peter mean here? It says, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus physically died, but the Holy Spirit rose him. By which he, through the Spirit in other words, Jesus went and he preached to the spirits in prison. Christ is talking about people whose spirits were imprisoned by sin back in the days of Noah. Peter's just saying, you know back in Genesis, Peter's quoting Genesis 6.3. Back in Genesis when God says, my spirit will not always strive with men. In the days of Noah, the spirit was striving with people to turn from their sin, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. That's what he's talking about. He's not saying Jesus went down and started preaching in some dungeon to give people a second chance. Does that make sense? He says, while God waited the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Noah was preaching during that 120 years. Now see, we're still learning. Look at all these verses we're just getting expanded on here in Genesis chapter 6. But, Pastor Doug, you're thinking, it says, and there were giants on the earth in those days after when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. All right, well, there you have it. How could the children be giants unless these were aliens or angels? There's something supernatural about these sons of God because the children are supernatural. Have you heard that? Well, were there giants in the days of David? Yes. Were there giants in the days of Moses when the spies came back? Was that through aliens and angels intermarrying with people? No. So what does it mean? It says they're giants. There is an interesting principle called genetic vitality. Genetic vitality is a law of life. Any of you know who the tallest man was that uh, lived in uh, U.S. history? 
His name was Robert Waldo. And when he was born in Alton, Illinois in 1918, he weighed a normal 8 pounds, 6 ounces. You know, my grandfather weighed 13 pounds when he was born. That's an amazing fact. Uh, and because he was my size. Uh, he weighed a normal 8 pounds, 6 ounces. He drew attention to himself when at 6 months he weighed 30 pounds. A year later, at 18 months, he weighed 62 pounds. Boy, he must have really eaten a lot. By the age of 8, he was 6 feet. By 10, 6 feet, 6 inches, 220 pounds. You wouldn't want to pick a fight with him in elementary school. By 14, he was 7 feet, 4 inches. By 16, 7 feet, 10 inches and 365 pounds. By 17, 8 feet, 1.5 inches. By 18, he was 8 feet, 4 inches, 390 pounds. By his 22nd birthday, he was 8 feet, 9 and a half inches, 491 pounds. Of course, he had a genetic defect that they call it giganticism that he just he kept growing and he grew so fast that generally those people are not very healthy. And uh, you, there is, are some pictures and video of him walking around and, and you can see he, he lived in the 1930s uh, and uh, was well, not video, it's ancient film. But um, he got an infection. He could never find shoes to fit right. He worked for a while for a, uh, was it the Buster Brown Shoe Company or something? Any of you remember that? And uh, s selling shoes, and they made him a pair of, you know, like 33 shoes, whatever they were. He had just enormous feet. But he got an infection in his foot. It turned into, uh, he got blood, a blood infection. He died at 22. Uh, but they just typically don't live very long with that kind of problem. Um, now, he didn't have genetic vitality. There are some people who are giants that are equally proportioned, like Shaquille O'Neal. How tall is he? Seven feet or almost? He's, yeah, he's close to seven feet. But, you know, he's just, he's athletic and he's on the basketball court and there's some people that they're perfectly proportional and they're just really big. Goliath was nine feet six inches. Do you realize that he was just about a foot and a half taller than Robert Waldo? So when people say they don't believe that Goliath really lived, well, that's, of course he did. The I mean, Bible says there were giants in our day, there's giants. But genetic vitality is something that we see everywhere in the world today. Do you all know what a liger is? A lion and a tiger gives you a liger, and it'll be bigger than a lion or a tiger. They're huge. And do you know what a zonkey is? A zonkey is half zebra, half donkey. But they're bigger than donkeys. <laughs> They don't, well, they don't naturally mate. I, well, no, I don't think so. I think they get a little help somehow yeah. <laughs> in doing that. But, uh, uh, and of course, if you cross a donkey and a horse, you get a mule. And they're big. People say he eats like a mule mm -hmm. because they've got tre tremendous uh, appetites. You, you've got something, it's a law of life with genes. Uh, let me give you something I read about genetic vitality in Florida. I used to live in southern Florida and they've got panthers there. And they're, they're endangered, but part of the reason is the panthers in southern Florida have been isolated from any other panther group because there's none really in central Florida, but they're in southern Florida. So they haven't had a chance to interbreed with a variety. And because there's one family that has been breeding, they have all kinds of health problems. So uh, well, I can read it here. Research in Florida panthers has revealed serious weakness in the genetic makeup of panther stock from inbreeding with a limited population a genetic weakness develops. There are certain races of people that um, because they've only married within their race, there are diseases that only Jews get, there are diseases that only African Americans get because they're not getting the genetic input from the outside. What else is it? It's not only a, uh, a zonkey and a liger, they got something called a wolfen, half whale, half dolphin. They must all be of the same kind. But with that in mind, uh, and somebody's crossbreeding, someone is crossbreeding American buffalo with African buffalo. That'll be very interesting. There's something else here. I hope I printed it out. I'm, I wanted to read you. 
Well, I hope it's in here. Hang on a second. I may need to do this. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Interracial couplers. This is the headline, Nature Magazine. Interracial couples may make taller, smarter children due to greater genetic diversity study. Now, normally you think, wow, that sounds like a racist headline. This is a headline based on university studies connected with California Berkeley and from the University of Edinburgh. Humans today are, they say, evolving to be smarter, taller, and even live longer than their ancestors. According to recent studies published in the journal Nature, the notable shift in height and intelligence throughout evolution may be linked to the genetic diversity of their offspring's parents. In an effort to delve into the benefits, the positive benefits of outbreeding, opposite of inbreeding, Building on a study from the University of California, Berkeley, senior researcher Jim Wilson and his team from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. I think you were just there, Pastor Ross, right? Um, it says they uh, studied the genetic diversity of a genome data within six biomedical traits ranging from, notice, height, cognitive ability. The researchers analyzed more than 100 separate studies carried out around the world including over 350,000 people living in both rural and urban or city environments. Here's it. Here's what I'm after. The findings revealed four traits. Height, lung capacity, general cognitive ability, we call it intelligence, and educational attainment have increased significantly in correlation with genomes that possessed more genetic diversity. When you get the sons of God, the children of Seth had been staying isolated for hundreds of years. Remember this, 1,500 years that go on before the flood. And then you've got the children of Cain remained isolated for hundreds of years. But the children of Seth, they began to say, well, we're just going to go shopping in Cainville. And they say, well, those girls are really pretty. And they, they start to see each other. How many of you remember how Dinah got in trouble? You remember Dinah, the daughter of Jacob? So she went out to see the daughters of the land in Shechem. And the young man saw her and they had an affair and it turned into a real disaster. How did Samson get into trouble? He went out to see the daughters of the land. And instead of marrying one of his own, his parents said, are there no daughters in Israel that you would marry from the uncircumcised Philistines? He said, get her for me. She pleaseth me well. <laughs> he basically said, I want her. You know, you're young, you're infatuated. And what kind of problems came from Samson dating outside of the church? He got a haircut, got a haircut. yeah. <laughs> he got a haircut and he had eye problems. That's right. Yeah, it didn't end well for Delilah or her. So, genetic vitality. You know, I always, when I talk about this, I always think of my friend John Lomacain. Now, John Lomacain is like 6'3", I think. And um, some of you know, Pastor Loma Cain. His mother was Filipino. His father was African American. They married and had John. He's taller than either. His mom, yeah, I met his mom. She's, <laughs> she's not even that big. <laughs> she's pretty small. And um, first thing she said, you know, he, he was adopted. He didn't know his own mother until years later. And first thing she said when she saw him is, how did you get so tall? And um, that's what you call genetic vitality. So when it says that the product of the marriage of these two had giants, that's, that's normally what happened. That's all it's talking about. It's not saying that they were some supernatural creatures. It still happens in our world today. <laughs> what, what's that? Big yeah. And his little tiny mother. Yeah, they, there you go. We have people in our church like that. How many of you have seen that? Yeah, our son Micah was 6'2". Yeah, and we're not... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's also because they're eating nuclear breakfast cereal. <laughs> but um, my father used to tell, my father the same height as me, my brother the same height, my grandfather were all like 5'9". And my father said, you know, when I, was, when I was a young man, he said, I was tall. He said, all this next generation came up and they just passed us. And we, I started feeling shorter as I got older. And um, part of that is because America in particular has a lot of genetic vitality because people have come in from all different parts of the world. If you do a DNA test, a lot of us, unless you were with the Germans that just stayed there in North Dakota, 
or, you know, one of some <laughs> in the Irish neighborhood of New York. Some of you guys are still, you know, you, you've had a lot of inbreeding. <laughs> but uh, most Americans now, they're crossing boundaries, and it's actually good for the gene pool, as they say. That's all it's talking about. Now, let's read on here. Back in, this is probably way too much information. But if you ever run into that, I wanted to give you facts on this subject. What was the result of them marrying? The Lord saw, well, it also says concerning the giants. There were giants on the earth in those days, uh, mighty men, men of renown. Now, you notice they're not only bigger and stronger. It says th they've got great capacity. What did we see from this cognitive study? That they, they actually perform better. And... Um, it says, Then the Lord saw wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continu continually. Then God declared he was sorry that he made. Isn't that a sad statement? I mean, God makes everything. You just go back a few chapters. He says, It's a paradise. It's good. It's good. It's very good. And man is going to live with pleasures at his right hand forevermore. But after sin and after. The, the intermarriage of good and evil. That's what the tree of life was. They wanted to mix the good and evil. Then it says, the wickedness of man was great in the earth. God was grieved that he made man. God is sorry. So the Lord said, I will destroy the man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air. He's now telling us 120 years in advance of the flood what he's going to do. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, it tells us that... Um, Vi violence filled the earth at this time. You read in verse 9, this is the genealogy of Noah. Now all of a sudden the, it's making a big shift in Genesis. It's going from the family of Seth, that was to be the remnant, and it's transitioning to Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Now, who else walked with God? Enoch, Enoch walked with God. And it says he was perfect in his generations. What does that mean? The Bible says be therefore perfect. Does it mean that Noah never sinned? No. Well, you read right after the ark. Yeah, he plants a vineyard and he gets drunk. So it's not saying he never sinned. It's saying that Noah had a habit of submitting to God, walking to God, wanting to do his will, uh, as Enoch did. And does it say Noah was saved because of his goodness or Noah found what? He found grace. He found grace for what? He found grace for walking with God. So what's going on in the world when Noah's walking with God? The wickedness of man was great. Look at the next verse. Well, wait, I want to finish this. Verse 10. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now this is a little bit of a mystery. I'll just drop this in here. Most of the sons, it says he lived this long and he had this son. He had lived this long, he had this son. But it tells us that when Noah had his three sons, it, it doesn't tell us what ages the three sons were. Some wondered, were they triplets? It doesn't separate their ages. It does seem to indicate that uh, Shem would be the whole oldest, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But notice the next verse. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, so that God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. What did Jesus say the conditions of the world would be before he returned? As it was in Sodom, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot. Now, in spite of these wicked, violent, corrupt conditions, these are words that are used, is Noah walking with God? So if Noah can walk with God and be perfect in his generations, back when world conditions were that deplorable, then can we? Amen. How did Noah do it? I told you a second ago. Noah found grace. People always think grace is a cover-up. But most of the time in the Bible, when it's talking about grace, it means God gives us grace. It's not just mercy for the past. It's power for the present to walk in a newness of life. Uh, when you're praying for God's grace, are you just asking him to cover up or asking God to give you power? He's showing grace to you. God gave grace to Noah because gr Noah turned to God. He gave him grace to walk in a godly way in a wicked world. So if Noah can do that, 
Lot was, you know, Lot, the Bible says, was a righteous man even in Sodom. God never intended for him to move to Sodom. You get the idea that it was more his wife's idea than his. By the way, you read that in Patriarchs and Prophets. Um, but you read where Peter says, that righteous man, speaking of Lot, that righteous man vexed his righteous soul day after day beholding their wicked deeds. So Lot is a righteous man in, surrounded by Sodom. Noah is a righteous man surrounded by a, a world about to be destroyed for its wickedness. What excuse do we have to say, oh, we can't live godly lives in this wicked world? I think that uh, by God's grace, all things are possible. Amen? You know, I, in, uh, in fairness to my associate pastors that are going to be picking up where I leave off, I want to give them a good pickup point in the story of Noah. And so I'm going to stop right there. And I think everyone here, now who are the sons of God? Descendants of Seth saw the daughters of Cain. They intermarried and the same thing that happened to Solomon, the same thing, the wisest man, the same thing that happened to Samson, the strongest man that happened to David is what happened there. And that's why the Bible says that uh, we should not be unequally yoked. After they intermarried, they lost their purity and things went down. Does that happen to the church? When we begin to commingle with the world, yes. we lose our, our distinctiveness. Yeah, God's calling us to be a, a peculiar people. He wants us to come out and be separate in that way and live holy. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank our friends who joined us for our study. Our time is up for this aspect. We're going to transition now to just our local prayer meeting and prayer requests. God bless you. We'll study together again next week.